Readings of Almighty God's Words Exposing Antichrists Item 7 They are wicked, insidious, and deceitful. Part 3 From what you've seen in the Bible and all of God's current utterances, does God advocate for gifts, learning, and knowledge? No. On the contrary, God dissects human knowledge and learning. How does God define gifts? How does He define supernatural abilities and special talents? You should understand that gifts, supernatural abilities, and special talents do not represent life at all. What does it mean that they do not represent life? It means that these things are not a result of people's acquisition of the truth. Where do these things actually come from? Do they come from God? No. God does not impart knowledge or learning to people, and He certainly does not give more gifts to people so that they may pursue the truth. God does not act in this way. You understand it now that I've put it like this, don't you? So where does the wickedness of antichrists manifest? How do they view gifts, learning, and knowledge? They esteem, follow, and even desire these things, especially gifts and supernatural abilities. If you tell an antichrist, if you have supernatural abilities, you'll attract evil spirits. They'll say, I'm not afraid. You'll respond, then there will be no hope of salvation for you in the future you'll be cast down to the 18th level of hell in the lake of fire and brimstone. And they'll still say, I'm not afraid. If you could have them speak in 10 different tongues and show off for others to look up to them, they would agree and be willing. God speaks so ordinarily and works so practically within normal humanity and they don't accept the method, form, and content of this work. They disdain it. How should people discern these matters? For example, some people can speak in various tongues. Can you accept this fact? Do you think it's normal or strange? Strange. Therefore, within the rational range of normal humanity, this is unacceptable. Someone who remembers everything, such as colors, shapes, faces, and names, and can recall hundreds of pages of a book after reading it, recounting it from beginning to end. After interacting with such a person, wouldn't you feel like you encountered something aberrational? But antichrists like these things. Tell me, when you come into contact with those in the religious community, the so-called evangelists, preachers, and pastors, collectively known as the Pharisees, do you feel that these people are what your heart needs, or is the practical God what your heart needs? The normal and practical God is closer to your inner needs, isn't he? So, talk about how you feel when you interact with Pharisees, the pros and cons, and whether it brings any benefits. If I interact with Pharisees, it feels fake and distant. The things they talk about are too hollow and false. Listening to it too much becomes nauseating, and I don't want to interact with them anymore. Are the viewpoints expressed by Pharisees correct or absurd? The nature of their viewpoints is absurd. Also, 
are the things they say mostly practical or hollow? Hollow. Do most people detest or enjoy hearing the absurd and hollow things, as well as the imaginative and notional things that they say? Most people dislike them and are unwilling to listen. After hearing their viewpoints and words, and observing their disposition and their false and hypocritical behavior, what do you feel in your heart? Are you willing to hear more? Are you willing to get closer to them, have in-depth interactions with them, and understand more about them? You're unwilling to interact with them. The key issue is that their words are too hollow full of theories and slogans. After listening for ages, you still feel clueless about what they're saying. Besides, their disposition is false and pretentious. They pretend to be humble, patient, and loving, to have the demeanor of a seasoned believer, one who is especially devout. When you eventually see their true face, you feel disgusted. You haven't had much deep interaction with me. How do you find the sermons I've given? Is there a difference between them and what the Pharisees talk about? What's the difference? God's sermons are practical. That is the basic point. Furthermore, what I talk about relates to your practice experiences, and various aspects of matters encountered in the process of doing your duties and in real life. It's not impractical and vague. Also, is each truth I discuss or viewpoint I take on matters practical or hollow? Practical. Why do you say it's practical? because it doesn't stray from real life. It's not about spouting hollow theories above real life. It's all related to people's discernment, understanding and practice in real life, and the states that arise in them when encountering various issues while doing their duties. In short, it involves topics related to how people practice their faith in God, their lives of believing in God, and their various states while doing their duties. We don't take out the Bible to expound hollowly on Genesis or Isaiah, nor do we speak emptily about Revelation. I dislike reading Revelation the most and don't want to speak about it. What's the use of speaking about it? If I told you which plague came to pass, what would that have to do with you? That is God's work. Even if God's work is fulfilled, how would that affect you? Won't you still be yourself? If I told you which plague came to pass, would you then be able to cast off your corrupt disposition? Would it be that miraculous? No. Therefore, when people follow to the end, they each will be separated according to their kind. Those who can accept the truth, enjoy reading God's words, and can practice the truth will stand firm. Those who are unwilling to read God's words or listen to sermons who persistently refuse to accept the truth and are unwilling to do their duties, will eventually be revealed and eliminated. Although they attend gatherings and listen to sermons, they never practice the truth. They remain unchanged and are averse to listening to sermons. They are unwilling to listen to them. Thus, even when they do their duties, it's in a perfunctory manner, never changing. 
These people are simply disbelievers. If people who sincerely believe in God often associate and live together with disbelievers, how would they feel? Not only would they not benefit or be edified, but they would also increasingly feel repulsed from their hearts toward them. Suppose that you come into contact with Pharisees and hear them speak, and you find that they speak clearly and logically, that they explain all the various rules and regulations in an understandable manner, and that their words seem to contain profound theories. But upon careful analysis, none of it is the truth reality, and it all amounts to hollow theory. For instance, they discuss the theory of the Trinity, theology, theories about God, what God is like in heaven with the angels, the situation with the incarnation of God and the Lord Jesus. How would you feel after hearing all of this talk? The result would be akin to listening to mythological stories. Why then do antichrists enjoy listening to and discussing these matters? And why are they willing to engage with such individuals? Isn't this their wickedness? What can be observed from their wickedness? Deep down, they have a certain need, which leads them to worship this knowledge and learning, and worship these things that the Pharisees have. So, what is their need? To be highly regarded by others. They not only need others to hold them in high regard, but in the depths of their hearts, they always want to be superhumans to be superior individuals or knowledgeable celebrities. They simply don't want to be ordinary people. What does their desire to be superhumans imply? In colloquial terms, it means they are out of touch with reality. For example, most people might at most wish if only I could fly high in the sky on an airplane. They might have such a wish, right? But what is the Antichrist's wish? One day, I want to sprout wings and soar to a distant place. They have such aspirations, do you? No. Why don't you? Because it's not realistic. Even if you were fitted with two large wings, could you fly? You're not that kind of creature, right? People like antichrists always rely on their imaginings, constantly pursuing their desires. Can they be saved? These are not the type of people God saves. God saves those who love the truth focus on reality, and pursue the truth in a grounded manner. Those who constantly desire to be superhumans or superior individuals are sick in the head. They are not normal people, and God will not save them. When antichrists come into contact with the incarnate God, they tend to ask peculiar questions. That they can pose such questions represents their deep-seated needs and what they worship in their hearts. Initially, upon testifying to God incarnate, some people always inquired, Does God read the Bible at home? It's not that I'm asking for myself. Actually, I'm not curious about this matter. I'm just asking on behalf of the brothers and sisters. Many of them also have this thought. They are contemplating in their hearts that if God does indeed read the Bible frequently, then being able to speak about the Bible and express the truth is quite normal. 
However, if God doesn't read the Bible and can still explain it, that would be a miracle, then he would truly be God. Of course, they didn't phrase it exactly like this. They directly asked, Does God read the Bible at home? What do you think? Should I read it or not? Do you read it? If you have never believed in Jesus, it would be quite normal not to read it. Do people who have believed read it? Those who have believed surely do. I started with faith in Jesus, so how could I not read the Bible? What if I didn't read it? Reading the Bible is normal. Not reading it is, of course, also normal. What does reading it or not reading it determine? If I weren't in this position, would anyone care whether I've read the Bible or not? No one would inquire about what I've read. Being in this special position, some people study this matter. They're always prying into it, asking, Did he read the Bible when he was young? What do they want to know exactly? There are two possible explanations, depending on whether I have read it or not. If I have read it, they feel that being able to explain the Bible is no big deal. However, if I haven't read the Bible and can still explain it, that's somewhat godlike. This is the result they desire. They want to get to the bottom of this. They think, if you haven't read the Bible and can still discuss it at such a young age, then that's worth investigating. This is God. That's their viewpoint, and they study God in this manner. Now consider those Pharisees who were well-versed in Scripture. Did they truly comprehend the words of Scripture? Did they discover the truth from Scripture? No. Now, did anyone who asked me whether I've read the Bible think about this? If they had considered it, they wouldn't be constantly looking into this matter. They wouldn't do something so foolish. People who don't grasp the truth or have spiritual understanding and cannot fathom God's essence and identity resort to such a method to resolve it in the end. Can this method resolve the issue? No, it can't. It can only resolve an issue of small curiosity. Actually, I also read the Bible. Who among believers doesn't read the Bible? I do a basic reading of it. At the very least, I read the four Gospels of the New Testament, flip through Revelation and Genesis, and take a look at Isaiah. What do you think is my favorite to read? The Book of Job. Exactly. The story in Job is complete and specific. The words are easy to understand. And besides, this story is valuable and can be helpful and edifying for people today. The facts have now shown that the story of Job indeed has had a huge impact on later generations. They have grasped many truths through Job, from his attitude toward God, as well as God's attitude and definition of him. They have grasped God's intention and what kind of path they should walk after believing in God. I use the book of Job as context to fellowship about certain ways in which people fear God and shun evil, as well as certain ways of submitting to God. This story is truly valuable. It's something that one should read in their free time. Some people, 
when they see God become flesh and witness the practicality and normality of God, may not fully be able to figure out whether he is truly God or what will happen in the future. However, after understanding some truths, they let go of these questions. They stop researching or caring about these matters and focus on doing their duties well, properly walking the path that they should and doing the work they ought to do well. But for some people, they will never let go of this. They insist on studying it. What do you think? Should I take care of this matter? Should I pay it any mind? There is no need to pay attention to it. Those who accept the truth naturally stop researching it, while those who don't accept the truth keep on doing it. What does this research indicate? Research is a form of resistance. In God's words, there is a saying. What is the result of resistance? Resistance leads to death. Some antichrists, although they have accepted this stage of work, are often concerned about whether the words spoken and the work done by the incarnate God have any supernatural element, whether there are elements beyond the range of normal humanity, and whether there are elements that can be taken out to prove his identity as God. They often research these matters, tirelessly studying how I speak, my manner and look as I speak, as well as the principles of my actions. What do they use for this research? They measure and study it against the image or standard of eminent and great people that they have grasped. Some even ask, since you are the incarnate God, your identity and essence must certainly be different from ordinary people. So, what are you good at? What special qualities do you have sufficient to make us follow and obey you and to make us accept you as our God? This question really stumped me. Honestly, I'm not good at anything. I don't have eyes that can see in all directions or ears that can hear from all sides. When it comes to reading texts, I can't scan ten lines at a glance, and a while after reading, I forget what I've read. I know a bit about music, but I can't read sheet music. If someone else sings a song a couple of times, I can sing along, but does that count as being good at it? Do I have any special talents, like being fluent in English or speaking a certain tongue? I can't do any of these things. What am I good at then? I know a bit about music, fine arts, dance, literature, film, and design. I have a superficial understanding of these areas. When discussing theories with experts, it's all jargon to me, but I can understand it when I see it. For example, in architectural design, if it involves professional and technical data, I don't understand it. However, if it's about color tones and the harmony of styles, I know a bit and have some insights. But whether I can study to become an expert or a talent in this field, that's hard to say because I haven't studied it. Considering what people can currently access, music, literature, dance, and film, things within the scope of our church's professional work. Learning a bit can give me a basic understanding. Some may say, now I know your background. 
you only have a basic understanding. I don't speak falsely. Indeed, I only have a basic understanding. However, there's one thing you may not grasp, and that might be my expertise. What expertise is that? I understand what the profession related to a certain area is, how a certain art is expressed, and what the scope and principles involved in it are. After mastering these, I know how to apply these useful things to the work of the church, making them serve the gospel work and achieve effectiveness in spreading God's gospel of the last days. Is this an expertise? With respect to what humanity lacks the most nowadays, if one can use the right methods and then convey the relevant truth, allowing people to see and accept it, this is the most effective. If you adopt a method that people can accept and can clearly present the truth and explain God's work, all in a way that normal human thinking can accept and be capable of reaching. This is tremendously beneficial for people. If we use the surface knowledge we possess and apply all these useful things, then it is enough to possess this kind of expertise. I excel in one thing. Have you figured it out? God excels in fellowshipping the truth. Does fellowshipping the truth count as a skill? Isn't that an expertise? So what am I good at? I excel in discovering the corrupt essence within all of you. If I weren't good at this, tell me, how could I work whenever problems arise with you? and I didn't know what corrupt disposition or nature essence they reveal. It would be impossible. Is it safe to say that discovering your corrupt essence is what I am best at? It ought to be what I am best at. I am best at identifying the corrupt disposition of individuals and their nature essence. I excel at discerning the path someone walks and their attitude toward God based on their nature essence. Then, through their manifestations, behaviors, and essence, I fellowship the truth to them, addressing specific issues and helping them resolve their problems and emerge from them. In reality, this isn't a skill. It's my ministry, it's work that falls within the scope of my responsibility. Are you skilled in this? No, we're not. So what are you skilled at? Exhibiting corruption. It's not accurate that you are skilled at exhibiting corruption. You are skilled at being unmoved by the truth after you hear it, treating it lightly, and adept at acting in a perfunctory manner while doing your duty without taking it seriously. Isn't that so? I tell you these things openly. Can Pharisees and Antichrists speak to you in such a way? They absolutely don't speak like this. Why not? They consider it shameful, a deficiency in humanity, a matter of privacy and one's background. They say, how could I let others know about my background? If that happened, wouldn't I lose all face, dignity, and status? How could I conduct myself then? According to them, they might as well stop living. So, after sharing my situation so openly with you, does it affect your faith in God? Even if you have some ideas about it, I'm not afraid. 
Why am I not afraid? Having some ideas is normal. It's temporary. People might experience visual and auditory illusions from time to time. There's always the possibility of a temporary distorted understanding or a momentary misunderstanding. Does that mean people will pack their bags because of this or grow negative and weak? But if you are genuinely someone pursuing the truth, can you deny God or leave God because of momentary notions? No, you can't leave. People who genuinely pursue the truth can approach and grasp these matters correctly. They can unconsciously accept these facts normally and gradually turn them into a true knowledge of God, an objective and accurate knowledge. This is a genuine understanding of the truth. One day, someone might say, the incarnate God is so pitiful, he can't do anything except speak the truth. What kind of tone is this? This is the tone of an antichrist. Do you agree with them? I don't agree. Why don't you agree? What they say isn't factual. What they say is factual. The incarnate God, apart from being able to express the truth in his speech, doesn't know how to do anything else. He doesn't have one particular skill. Is this pitiful? Do you think so? No. Then what do you think? Some people say, it's precisely because God is ordinary and normal, doing practical work, that we as corrupt humanity have the opportunity to attain salvation. Otherwise, we would all end up in hell. We're getting a big advantage now, so let's enjoy it secretly. Do you have this feeling? Yes. But some people are different. They feel that God's just talking. There's nothing supernatural about him. What am I gaining? I have my own notions and ideas about God, and I judge God behind his back. But God hasn't disciplined me. I haven't suffered or been punished. Steadily, their audacity grows, and they dare to say anything. Some people say, this is how you ought to know the incarnate God. When he speaks, works, and expresses the truth, it's the Spirit of God working within, and the flesh is just a shell, a tool. The true essence is the Spirit of God. It is the Spirit of God speaking. If it weren't for the Spirit of God, could the flesh speak those words? These words seem correct when you listen to them, but what meaning do they carry? Blasphemy. Correct. They are blasphemy. What a vicious disposition. What are they trying to say? You are such an unremarkable person. You don't have a noble appearance. You're not that impressive looking. Your speech is not eloquent or theoretically sophisticated. You have to think about it before saying anything. How could you be the incarnate God? Why are you so blessed and fortunate? Why aren't I the incarnate God? In the end, they say, it's all the Spirit of God working and speaking. The flesh is just the outlet of the Spirit. It is a tool. Saying this makes them feel even. It is jealousy, which leads to hatred. The implication is, how come you are the incarnate God? Why are you so fortunate? 
How did you obtain this advantage? Why didn't I get it? I don't think you are any better than me. You are not eloquent enough. You're not highly educated. You are not as good looking as I am. And you are not as tall as me. How are you any better than me? How come you are the incarnate God? Why not me? If you are the incarnate God, then lots of people are too. I have to fight for this too. Everyone says you are God. There's nothing I can do about that, but I'll still judge you like this. Speaking like this relieves my hatred. Isn't this vicious? They dare to say anything in order to vie for position. Isn't this seeking death? If you don't want to accept that he is God, who is forcing you? Did I force you? I didn't force you, did I? Firstly, I didn't plead with you to accept. Secondly, I didn't use extreme means to force you to accept. Thirdly, the Spirit of God hasn't intervened, telling you that you must accept or else you'll be punished. Has God done this? No. You have the right to freely choose. You can choose not to accept. So why, if you don't want to accept, do you end up accepting anyway? Aren't you just seeking blessings? They desire blessings but can't accept or obey, or they still feel unwilling. So what do they do? They say such malicious words. Have you heard these kinds of words before? I'd heard them more than just once or twice among some people. Some people think, we started believing in God together with you. At that time, you were young, often writing down God's words. Later, you started preaching. You are just an ordinary person. We know about your background. What kind of background do I have? I'm just an ordinary person. That's the truth about me. Just because I'm ordinary and normal and can have so many people following me today, isn't that why you are unwilling? If you're unwilling, then don't believe. This is God's work. I can't shirk my responsibility. I have no excuse, and I haven't done anything hurtful or harmful. So, why do you approach me with this viewpoint? If you're unwilling, then don't believe. Believe whoever you are willing to believe. Don't follow me. I haven't forced you. Why are you following me? Some even came to my home to investigate. What were they investigating? They asked me, do you go back home? How is your economic situation at home right now? What do your family members do? Where are they? How are their lives? Some people even scrutinized an extra quilt or blanket in my house. These people aren't willing at all to believe in God. Why aren't they willing? because they think, God shouldn't be like this. God shouldn't be so small, so normal and practical, and so common and ordinary. He's too common, common to the point that we can't recognize Him as God. Can your eyes that lack spiritual understanding recognize God? Even if God came down from heaven to tell you this, you still couldn't recognize Him. 
Are you worthy of seeing the real person of God? Even if God clearly tells you that He is God, you wouldn't accept it. Could you recognize Him? What kind of people are these? What is their nature? Wickedness. These people really broaden my horizons. Since taking on the work of God, as I carry out my work with this identity and position, I've come into contact with certain individuals. Faced with this diverse array of talents, I've observed that two words are inseparable from the corrupt disposition of humans, evil and wicked. Both of these encompass it. Why do they study me every day? Why are they unwilling to acknowledge my identity? Isn't it because I am a very ordinary and normal person? If I were in the form of a spiritual body, would they dare? They wouldn't dare to study me in this way. If I had a certain social status, coupled with special abilities, the image and appearance of a great man, and a somewhat evil, domineering, and ruthless disposition, would these people dare to come to my home to investigate and study me? They absolutely wouldn't dare. They would avoid me. They would hide when they saw me coming. And they definitely wouldn't dare to study me, would they? Then why are they able to study me in this way? They see me as an easy target. What does being an easy target entail? It means I am too ordinary. What does ordinary imply? You are just a person. How could you be God? You entirely lack the knowledge, learning, gifts, talents, and abilities that God should have. How are you like God? You're not like Him. Therefore, it's difficult for me to accept that you are God, to follow after you, to listen to your words, and to submit to you. I need to make a thorough investigation. I need to watch you, to keep an eye on you, and not let you do anything improper. What are they trying to do? If I had social standing and a certain level of fame, for example, if I were a first-class singer and one day bore testimony to say that I am God, Christ, wouldn't at least some people be convinced? The number of people studying me would be relatively fewer. It's just the fact that I am ordinary, normal, practical, and too common that reveals many people. What does it reveal in them? It reveals their wickedness. How far does this wickedness go? It goes to the point that when I walk past them, they will study me for a long time, looking for the likeness of God in my back, checking if any miracles accompany my speech. They often speculate in their hearts. Where do these words come from? Were they learned? It doesn't seem likely. He doesn't seem to have the time to study. He has changed so much in recent years. It doesn't seem like something learned. So, where do these words come from? It's hard to fathom. I need to be cautious and they keep studying. Those who constantly study don't engage, interact, or converse with me face to face. They are always contemplating behind my back, always wanting to find mistakes in my words and get hold of some leverage. 
They can study a sentence that doesn't align with their notions for days, and a slightly stern remark can develop a notion in them. Where do these things come from? They come from the minds and knowledge of people. What kind of people are those who can study God, who can constantly use their thoughts to speculate about God? Can they be categorized as people with a wicked disposition? Absolutely. Seeing as you have the time and the energy, it would be great if you could ponder the truth. Which truth wouldn't take you some time to fellowship about and ponder? There are so many truths that you might not be able to ponder them all in this lifetime. There are too many truths that a person needs to understand. They do not feel any burden about this matter, yet they never forget those external and superficial matters and are always studying them. As soon as I speak, they blink their eyes, staring at my look, scrutinizing my actions and expressions, and speculating in their hearts, does he resemble God in this aspect? His speech doesn't resemble God. His look doesn't quite match. How can I fathom him? How can I see what he thinks about me in the depths of his heart? What does he think about this matter and that matter? How does he define me? They always harbor these thoughts. Isn't this wicked? This is beyond saving. It's too wicked.